according to the latest newsletter, the theme for this uh, satsang is, is life a dream or is this world a dream or something. So I will begin by briefly talking on that subject and then brief everyone's last question. Um, but before I uh, take up the subject of dream, there's just one thing I'd like to say which is uh, carry on from, um, from when I was last year in July. At that time, one of the, some of the questions were centered around, but isn't, isn't life beautiful? You, should, should we just uh, neglect all the, the, the positive side of this uh, life as a, uh, as a person in this world? Um, I wanted to say at that time, but because of the talk went in other words, I didn't finish off saying it. Um, there is a Tamil saint called Patnaka, and in one of his verses, he writes about the pleasure of worldly life, uh, of embodied life. He tells a story of a man who was going through the jungle, and um, a tiger appeared and started to chase him. So he was running away from the tiger, and while running away, he tripped and he fell, fell into a well. And as he was falling down, he caught a root. So above him there is the tiger uh, waiting if he could get out. Below in the water of the well there's a crocodile. He's holding on to this root. There is a rat that is chewing the root. And in this situation he noticed there is a, a bee's nest nearby with honey dripping from it. So he licked for honey and said, isn't life beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> so, whatever um, small joys we find in this life, it's all very fleeting. We, we know we, we're born and we're going to die, and we have a little time here, and um, according to sages like Patnata and Bhagavan, we should make use of this time to get ourselves out of this situation, rather than just dragging it a little pleasure of a few drops of honey over to here and there, we should uh, extricate ourselves from the situation, for which Bhagavan has taught us the way is to investigate ourselves and find out what we really are. Um, that is indirectly connected with the, the main topic which I've been asked to talk about, which is, is life a dream? Yes, according to Bhagavan, life is a dream. Um, uh, it, it, for many people, it, uh, it's, um, it's a difficult thing to accept that life is a dream. Because uh, the, uh, um, the, the nature of our mind is to take what we experience to be real. So we experience this world as if it's real. And the Bhagavan points out that as real as this uh, so-called waking, uh, state, everything that we experience in this waking state, as real as this seems to be, so real does what we experience in a dream seem to be at the time we are dreaming. There's a reason for this. Why we, um, why whatever we experience seems to us to be real. According to Bhagavan, what is real is only ourself. Atma uh, the, uh, the basis of all these things. Uh, not even what our self, our real self is not what is experiencing all this, but the source from which the ego who experiences all this arises. That is what we really are. And that alone is real. When the ego rises, it's a mixture of that real element, which is the chit aspect, and the jada aspect. The ego is sometimes called chit jada kranti. It's a knot that binds, that seemingly binds together uh, consciousness or awareness and this jada, this um, non-conscious body as if they're one. So we feel I am this body, this body is conscious. We, these are, in our experience these are mixed up. In, in, in this uh, mixed feeling, I am this body, which is what, is the, what the ego is, in this mixed feeling there is a real element and an unreal element. The real element is I the awareness, and the unreal element is the body. But because we now take 
I am body to be equal. We take the body, we experience this body as if it's I. We, uh, we experience this body, when we experience it as I, we experience it as real. In other words, we superimpose our own reality upon the body and thereby experience the body as real. And because this body is part of uh, this world, uh, a material, physical world, we cannot experience the body as real without experiencing the world as real. So we experience all this as if it's real. In our experience, it all seems to be real. Exactly the same thing happens in dream. In dream, we experience the body as I, not the same body, it would be some other body, because this body supposedly is lying on a bed at that time. But Bhagavan said, that's assuming that this, is a, this waking world exists when we're not aware of it, which Bhagavan says is a, a false assumption. Um, but anyway, if, 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 for example, in dream, if we're injured, when we wake up, that injury is no longer there. So they're two different bodies. So we experience a different body as I, a different world, but because that, body, that dream body is part of the dream world, we experience the dream world as real, so long as we're experiencing it. Only when we wake up, does it cease to seem real to us because we no longer experience that dream body as ourselves. So the reality which we superimpose upon that dream body in dream world, we now superimpose upon this body in this world. Both of us said they're both equally dreams. Um, this, is, this question whether life is a dream is a question which is Philosophers have been tackling this question for um, thousands of years, and it's not an answer. It's not. It's not a question that um, philosophers can ever reach a conclusive conclusion about. But what we can learn from philosophy is, we, we think carefully about it. Though we cannot be sure of this light of the dream, we also cannot be sure that it is not a dream. We have, we have very strong grounds for doubting that this is perhaps just another dream. Because um, if, if we were now dreaming, we would be taking this to be the waking state and we would be talking just as we're talking now. And we would feel that we're sitting in a room full of other people and that there are so many other people who are aware of all this. If we suddenly wake up now to some other dream or some other so-called waking state, we will then think, we will then conclude that all, that all those people sitting in that room were just my own mental creation. But how can we be sure that this is not a dream? There's no way. People try to put forward so many arguments, trying to argue that some, in some way this, what we're experiencing now is different to what we experience in dream. There are two problems with that argument. Firstly, all we can say is, people say, for example, dreams are very unstable. We, we flip from one scene to another. One moment we're in London, next moment we're in Tiranamalai, next moment we're in New York. We're talking to someone who is our dead father, and the next minute it's, um, it's some stranger we're talking to. But even the people are, more, are changing. That does happen in some dreams, because what often is, the reason why dreams, many dreams are less stable than this waking state, the stability of the state, of the, of the scenario in the state, is dependent upon our attachment to a body. Because in dreams, we tend to be less strongly attached to that, to the dream body, uh, the, the state is less stable. And because we are less strongly attached to the body in um, in dream, not all dream, but gen as a general rule, if we, in the dream, we try to investigate ourselves, try to turn our attention towards ourselves, what usually happens is we immediately wake up. That in the dream, because the dream is a less, because we're less attached to that body, the dream is a less, uh, um, a less stable state. So it's easily dissolved by a little bit of self-investigation, a little bit of self-attentiveness. That, unfortunately, doesn't happen in this state. Um, well, or possibly fortunately, because the very stability of the state, the strength of our attachment, actually means 
but we can go deeper in our self-investigation because it, uh, uh, it, this state is, these, isn't so easily dissolved. So in order to dissolve this, we have to go still deeper within ourselves. Um, that is, that's one thing about the, the, the argument that say that waking state and dream state are different, is that they're not all, some dreams are very much more stable than others. So we know from our own experience that there are, there are more stable dreams and less stable dreams. So why not we just take this as a more stable dream? Um, another argument, I mean, there, there's so many different types of arguments that people can put forward, but one fundamental flaw with any argument, with, with, with whatever argument we try to put forward to say this state is different to a dream, is based upon an assumption, but now we're awake, but this is not a dream. In other words, it's circular argument. It's what's called begging the question in philosophy. It's assuming the conclusion uh, and taking the conclusion as one of the premises for the argument in support of that conclusion. It, it's arguing in a circle, in other words. So there's no non-circular way of arguing that this state is not a dream. So though we can't be sure that this is a dream, we equally well cannot be sure that it's not a dream. So it's perfectly reasonable for us to listen to Bhagavan, pay heed to what Bhagavan has told us, that this is just a dream. Um, so then the question arises, how is this relevant to us? How is it relevant to our life? How do we apply this? Well, obviously Bhagavan didn't expect us to um, to outwardly act as if this world is a dream. How can we, how can we, the, the person we now take ourselves to be, the body and mind, are themselves a part of the dream. So we, they, to, to try and, I mean, if, if, for example, supposing I say, oh, this is a dream, so I'm the only uh, real person here, all these other people are just my mental projection. So it doesn't matter if, uh, if this person by, sitting by the side of the road is starving. It doesn't matter if there are so many refugees um, starving in, uh, in refugee camps. It doesn't matter to me, but I'm the only one, so I only care about myself. That obviously is not what by, the conclusion both one take, expects us to take, because um, when Bhagavan says this is a dream, and he says there's only one ego, <coughs> He, he says Ekajiva Vada, the, 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 the argument that there's only one uh, jiva, one ego. But um, if, if this state is a dream, obviously there's only one person experiencing it. You don't have multiple people experiencing the same dream. So if this is a dream, there's only one person, one, let's not say one person, there's only one ego experiencing it. But there's a distinction between the ego and the person we take ourselves to be. The ego is what attaches itself and takes that person to be I. But we can say the person we take ourselves to be, Michael, is, I can say, my objective self. Whereas the ego is my subjective self. The ego is just the one who is experiencing all this. So there is only one ego. But this ego attaches itself to this person and takes this person, Michael, to be, I, to be myself. I, I am Michael. Michael is just one among so many other people. As real as Michael is, so are all the other people in the world. We cannot say Michael is more real than, or I mean, <laughs> we, we, we cannot say our, the person we take ourselves to be is any more real than any other person. Because they're all part of the dream. So if Michael, now because I experience myself as Michael, um, for example, recently I had a very bad uh, infected tooth. It was causing me a lot of pain. So I went to the dentist and he drove it and uh, did whatever they have to do. Um, I'm not going to neglect that because for me, Michael and Michael's pain is very real. So long as I'm experiencing myself as Michael, I can't, um, I can't dismiss Michael and Michael's pain. If I had the, the strength, if I had the love to really uh, experience myself alone, to turn my attention within, then I could ignore Michael. 
But the, so long as I'm experiencing myself as mindful, my mind is going outwards. So I'm not, uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, being aware only of myself. I'm being aware of Michael, and hence, because I'm aware of Michael, I'm aware of everything else. So it, the pain that Michael experienced is so important to me that I want to do take whatever steps are necessary to alleviate. Or if Michael is hungry, I try to find food for Michael. So if Michael is important, is not every other person in our dream equally important? Because Michael is no more real than any other person in the dream. Well, the ego who happens now to be experiencing Michael as I, in some other state will experience some other person. When, this, when Michael dies, if, if, uh, if I don't uh, merge in the reality, this ego will go and project another dream and experience itself as some other person. So, if, and maybe John, and maybe Jill, and maybe Jack, who knows who, who I'll be. So, it's, um, that person will seem to me to be real at that time. So, um, so long as we take a person to be ourself, we, um, that, that means our mind is going outwards. We're experiencing a world full of other people. And those other people matter every bit as much as we do. So Bhagavan isn't recommending that we, we don't care about the suffering in the world. Now we're, we, we know this refugee crisis is there. Are we not to care about these people? Supposing we were in that situation, would we not desperately be trying to... Um, one argument some people say is, oh, why all these, these people were already in refugee camps in Turkey, their lives were not in danger, why should they should try and cross the Mediterranean? Some people have said that about that uh, three-year-old boy who was washed up on a beach. They, they criticized his father, but why, they not, why don't they stay in Turkey? Because they're greedy economic migrants, they wanted to come to Europe for a better life. But what sort of life they had in refugee camps in Turkey? They barely survive. They, they get barely enough humanitarian aid, and there's so many of them, there's not enough humanitarian aid going around. And there's no life for them there, no future, nothing. There's no education for their children, there's no career prospects, nothing. These are people whose homes have been decimated, and who are trying to, who, obviously they want to rebuild the life for themselves. They want to have a job, to contribute to society, to see their children educated. Is that, an un is that such an unreasonable uh, desire? So if we were in that position, we would be doing exactly the same. So how can we not have compassion for those people? Okay, it's all a dream. But we are taking this dream to be real, so long as we allow our mind to go out. So Bhagavan, what Bhagavan talks about the world being a dream is not, was not meant to influence our outward behavior. Our outward behavior is the actions of his body, which is itself a part of the dream. So his body should act in the dream, or is that it's all vivaharika satya, it's all transactional reality. Uh, uh, that is, it's, as far as interaction is concerned, as far as action is concerned, this is all real. It's not ultimately real, but in our experience it's real. So why Bhagavan taught us that the world is a dream? The reason is that uh, it's not to uh, change our outward behavior, it is to um, encourage us to turn within, to find out According to Bhagavan, when the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. When the ego does not exist, um, nothing exists. Therefore, the ego is everything, according to Bhagavan. So, he gives us good reason to investigate this ego. So, if this world is a dream, it, the dream uh, projected by the experience of the ego. So, we, if we have good reasons to um, investigate this ego. When we allow our attention to come out, we have to act in this world as if it's real. We have to, when we're hungry, we have to eat food, we breathe, we breathe air, we drink water. All these things are necessary for the survival of ourselves because we experience ourselves with this body. 
equally, just as all these things are important to us, they're also important to all the other people, and also all the other animals. It, it, just because um, we have a human body, and a cow has a cow body, and a sheep has a sheep body, they are no less sentient feeling beings than we are. So there's no justification for us to slaughter animals, to send them by their, uh, by, well, billions of animals are slaughtered every year just for human consumption. There is no way that is morally justified. Even if this is a dream, that is still unacceptable. Because if, if, even though this is a dream, we take the person we now experience ourselves to be real. We wouldn't walk, we wouldn't happily submit to be taken to a slaughter camp. It's the slaughter house to be a butcher for me. So if we wouldn't tolerate that for ourselves, why should we tolerate it for any other being? So all, be, all, all sentient beings, whether human or non-human, all are equally important. That is why Bhagavan lived the life of, he exemplified by his actions, so much compassion. When his leg brushed against the hornet's nest, he felt compassion for those hornets. He had disturbed their nest, he let them bite his, sting his leg. He was going to be excruciating pain. Because for him, the, the sentience in that, um, in the, the body of each hornet was as real as the sentience in his own body. So, it's, it, 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 but one doesn't expect us to behave, our, our outward behavior to change. What he expects us to change, what he expects us to change is to detach ourselves from this person, this dream person, Michael, is not really what I am. So who am I? To turn our attention within, to investigate. Now I seem to be Michael. How this, when I was sleeping, I didn't experience myself in Michael. In dream, I experienced myself, I may have still had the same name, Michael, in dream, but the body I was experiencing wasn't this Michael body, but some other Michael body. And when, if there was some previous life or some future life, in other words, if the dreams continue, whether this body so-called lives or dies, um, I will experience myself as other people. But, um, so who is this I who is, ex who is attaching itself to people? And it's, it, it, uh, in one point in, in Guru Vachitra, where Bhagavan said the, the life lived by an ego is like, uh, is like a, a ghost in a cremation, in a burial ground, possessing corpses. This body, according to Bhagavan, is just a corpse. It's just an animated corpse. So each one of us, well, uh, yeah, each one of us is, a, is just a ghost who has possessed a, a corpse. So, um, uh, Bhagavan has given a very, well, in some way, I mean, the dream and the dream, uh, the fact that the, this life in the dream is one very good reason why we should not be overly attached to our external life and why we should turn our mind within to try and investigate uh, who we really are. But by the way, give us many other reasons, but this is one this is a very important uh, um, one of the important basis of Bhagavan's teachings. And it should uh, motivate us to turn within to try to investigate ourselves. So I hope I've said not wrong on that so if anyone wants to ask any questions. There can only be one case of realization. Has it happened? Hmm? Has it happened? You have to answer that. You're the one jiva. So <laughs> would, would, would there still be this if it had happened? No. Because according to Bhagavan, all this comes into existence only when you rise and experience yourself as a person. When you rise as an ego, 
the, whenever the ego raises, it always raises grasping forward. For one second, we're looking up to. The first form it grasps is a body. So it's only after this ego rises that everything else rises. But well, simultaneously, actually. But the, the, the root of the rising of everything is the rising of the ego. So for all cases of apparent realization, just in the dream cases. Well, it, it, what, you, what we call realization, is, it's an idea we have. We haven't experienced it, so it's just an idea. This person is a jnani, this person is not a jnani. But one says that's ignorant. The only jnani is jnana itself. That is, if the ego can never realize the self. Only the self can realize the self. The self is always realized. So, Bhagavad used to say there's nothing new to know. The problem is that a wrong knowledge has arisen, that I am this body. That if we remove the wrong knowledge, what will remain is the true knowledge. That is what is called realization. So in Guru Chakra Kuvay, Lord Narayana spoke about Sutalibu. So that is, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm yeah, that. Yeah. Is that similar to telling... Sutalibu, sutu means pointing. So it's, uh, um, it's a term Muruna often uses, sutalibu. What he means is the objective attention, basically. Aribu means uh, knowledge or awareness. So it's the pointing awareness, it's the, it's the outwardly directed awareness. Is it that to be turned? Yes, yes. But when we turn it within, it's no longer pointing because it remains in its source. When, when, when we point outwards, the ego rises. When we, when we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we are not experiencing ourselves as we really are. We're experiencing ourselves as ego. So we're very turning of our attention towards anything else, not that anything else exists in the absence of our turning our attention to it, but the very directing of our attention towards anything else is what, uh, is what causes the rising of the ego. A rising of the ego, I mean, they're the same thing, actually. So yes, Sutari is basically the ego. But the very nature of the ego is to be aware of things other than itself. The ego cannot stand without being aware, cannot stand for a single moment without being aware of something other than itself. But the thing, everything other than the ego, everything that seems to be other than the ego, comes into existence only when the ego rises. So the ego rises, projects all this, and um, so, yeah, so long as the ego is aware of any, so long as, let's say, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we are ego, we are experiencing ourselves with ego. In order to experience ourselves as we really are, we need to turn our attention within to focus our entire attention on ourselves. So that we are, in other words, we, we need to try to isolate our self-awareness from, from awareness of anything else. When we isolate ourselves, isolation is the meaning of the Sanskrit word uh, kaivalya. So it's, it's, it's when kaivalya, which, which is a term which is often used for, as, a, um, as a synonym for moksha, for liberation or self-knowledge or whatever, it's when we totally isolate ourselves and, and are aware of ourself alone. That doesn't mean necessarily physical isolation. It's, it's Not physical isolation, no, no, no. Because we, so long as we are aware of the body, we are not isolated, because this body isn't what we are. This body is something anya, something other than ourselves. So the real isolation is not, a, is not going and sitting in a cave in the Himalayas. The real isolation is going and sitting in the cave in our heart. In other words, turning our attention within and being aware of our self alone. No. So, you do live the life 
in a dream at that point? Do you see life as a dream? No, because you don't, you don't see life at all. Well, I mean, what we call life, that you take life to be without the work. But, but Yani is not aware of anything other than itself. But yes. about the example, he was aware of people's suffering and people's lives and trying to help. So he was... Which Bhagavan? Oh, we, the complete Bhagavan. The Bhagavan felt complete. It didn't need to go outside for anything. Yes, but the, the, the complete Bhagavan wasn't aware of anything other than himself. We mistake a person to be Bhagavan. We mistake that body to be Bhagavan. Bhagavan said, I am not this body. No, but he still functions in the body. He still functions. The body functions. The Bhagavan once said, see this radio. We, he we hear it uh, talking and uh, music coming from it and everything. But open it up, there's nothing inside. So also, open up this. It's just a transmitter. Open up this, but no, no one inside. And he really wasn't aware of this transmitter? No. Because he, he was aware of what is real, and only what is real. What is real according to Baba, what actually exists, is only Atmasomupa, only our own real self, what we actually are. Sorry, I'm dense, but there was still functioning. There was still functioning. In our view, mm -hmm. both of them, all the actions of the jnani, and the body and mind of the jnani, seem to be real only in the view of the agnani, the one who is yes. self the Yes, so yes. Yeah. Because we take ourselves to be a person, a body and mind, we you superimpose our own ignorance upon Bhagavan and we say, he is this body of mind. Bhagavan once said, uh, uh, when, uh, in, in connection with uh, what he talked about life being a dream, when people are, then Bhagavan, are you also part of my dream? He said, yes. But what you take to be Bhagavan, this person, this body of mind, is just a part of your dream. And the interaction. Yes, but he, used, he gave a nice analogy. There's a, um, a traditional belief that elephants are so afraid of lions that if an elephant dreams about a lion, it will at once wake up. The fright will waken it up. So Bhagavan said the guru, the outward form of the guru, is like the lion in the elephant's dream. The, the lion in the elephant's dream is totally unreal, but it brings about a real awakening. So in the outward form of the Guru, even his teachings, everything, it's all unreal. But it uh, shocks this uh, elephant ego into waking up. Thank you. <laughs> so that, that was my next question. Is yeah. If the mind is creating the world, yeah. then I was going to ask, so I created Bhagavan, I created Bhagavan Amalai, Yes, yes. Everything, but yes. then how do I know, or who is it that knows that it's not real? Um, everything that, Bhagavan has said, everything that we see outside is uh, projected from within. So, because they all, they, we, this is a, a bit of a simplification, but, it, 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 but we, we can, one way of explaining it, when a picture is projected on the screen, Let's forget about colours for colour um, from candy. Let's just take black or old black and white um, cinema. What do you have on the screen? You've got a mixture of light and darkness. But it's only the darkness that makes all the forms there. But between the darkness there is light. Both one is the light. Everything else in this world is the, is the darkness. Let's take it in that way. So Bhagavan, whereas everything else is a projection of our vastness, we can take Bhagavan to be the projection of the light within us. Does the mind won't allow you to accept a lot of things, like when you take the dream, etc. Yes, so when the mind will, so when the mind goes out, it all appears real. We, we cannot avoid that. The only way to avoid that is to turn the mind within. That's why in Akramulai, 
Bhagavan, well, he said, it's what, what I actually quote Bhagavan, Tirimbiya Handani Dinamaha Kankan Tariyam in Janay and Aranachala. Oh, Aranachala, what a wonder you told, you told me, um, daily turn, with, uh, turn inward and see yourself with the inner eye. It will then be known. But that's the harder part too, because when you say turn inward and see inside, it's yes. the ego, the mind doing it. How do I know it's not the mind tricking me that I am really the mind is tricking you. We can be absolutely sh where there's absolutely no doubt the mind is tricking us until the mind completely dissolves. Because I so, may be deluding myself, thinking that I'm doing this or that. Well, okay. What is the practice of uh, self-investigation at Mandachara? It is trying to. We can only investigate ourselves by observing ourselves, by attending to ourselves. So we, what we are trying to do, why we have not yet succeeded? Because we've not, we've not yet um, managed to isolate ourselves, to experience ourselves alone, in complete isolation from everything else. So what we, are, the self-investigation we've been doing so far is not entirely successful. It's like if you're, um, if, if you're, uh, so you had some trouble with your eyesight and you're trying to read, supposing you had an eye operation and slowly, slowly your sight is coming back. You, you try to read, you're still not quite able to read. So you, you, every day you try to read a little to try, and slowly, slowly things come into focus. It's a bit like that. We slowly, slowly, by daily practicing, by, though the, by the way I use the word dinam, in daily, what it actually means is constantly. We're repeatedly doing it. By, by repeatedly doing it, we are refining our power of attention. Our power of attention has now become very gross. We've been using it for who knows how many uh, lives. We've been using it only to experience other things. Other things are relatively gross. So now we're trying to use it to experience ourselves. That is something much more subtle. So we, we, we have to refine our power of attention. It's like trying to, to um, train our eyes so that we can focus on very, very small, minute things. But that is also done by the mind. It's it is thought. done by the mind, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is done by the mind, there's no escaping that. Because the mind is what we experience ourselves to be. But one thing about the mind, the mind is not wholly unreal. Because the mind is mind and ego are the same, but from in, in this in this respect, the one respect in which mind is different, I can explain it after. But let's say ego, uh, ego is chit jada granti. It's a mixture of chit, the pure self awareness, and jada. So um, the real element in the ego is this chit element. So we are trying to focus our attention on this chit element. We're trying to isolate our self-awareness from awareness of anything else. So uh, though we have to use our mind to do this, uh, this, is, um, this is the key to get out of the prison we, we, we've got ourselves in. But the mind is what has locked us in this prison. The same mind is what has to unlock us. That, that's the thing. How do we know about when? We just have to continue investigating. Bhagavan has assured us that if we persevere in this, we will succeed sooner or later. It's a matter of... of and we can't even measure our progress. We can't say how far or how near we are. Um, I think most of us still feel we're pretty far from it. But who knows? Maybe during the course of this life we, we, we just go on practicing, practicing, practicing and then um, one very good opportunity will come at the end when we are... Why, one of the reasons why we are not able to give up, we are so attached to our life in this world. We are so attached, I'm so attached to myself as Michael. Now I've been Michael for the last 60 years. I built up so many experiences and so much, I identify with so many things. It's very difficult for me to let go of all these things. 
But by practicing, 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 slowly, slowly, though it may seem to me that I'm not making any progress at all, slowly, slowly, inwardly, things are being, uh, the attachments are being weakened. And then at the moment of the death of the body, when we're in a way forcibly separated, none of us want to leave the body, none of us want to die. But a time will come where that will be forced upon us. So that, that's why it's often said the, the, the moment of death is the most favorable moment. For, but we can't expect that we're going to get realization of uh, the, the last moment if we're not trying now. If we succeed at the, at the moment of death of the body, it's because of all the practice we've done before. We, we don't necessarily have to wait for the death of the body, it may happen before then. But at least that's a, a favorable block to do. And if it doesn't happen then, whatever we, however much we have done, we're, we're building up a bank account. It won't go in, the, it won't go in, in, in to waste. And it's a bank account that can't be squandered. If you do lots of good karmas, and then enjoy all the fruits, and while you enjoy your fruits, you do bad karmas, you lose it, that bank. So, the, the, the debit and credit in the karma account, you, you can squander all your credit. But the credit, you, this, this is not a karma. Social investigation is not a karma. It's a non-karma, it's a, a karma. Because we're turning within and just trying to be. So the, the, this is what the, the credit we're building up. That is the, the, but the, the credit is in the form of love to experience ourselves and detachment from experiencing anything else. This will never go into waste. So we just have to continue working at it patiently, whether it's this lifetime or 100 lifetimes hence. It's every little bit of effort we make is worth it. Whether, it's, whether it happens now, in, 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 in the next few minutes or a thousand births ahead doesn't matter because it's all ultimately That's a dream. Yeah. What matters is moment to moment, each moment we are faced with a choice. We can either choose to experience other things or choose to try to experience ourselves alone. That, that choice is there from moment to moment in our life. We all know what, what we choose at least 99% of the time, at least I don't know what I'm choosing, which is the wrong choice. Uh, but occasionally we try, we, we, we try to make the right choice. But continue trying to make the right choice, little by little, it won't go in vain. But everyone is saying, uh, but those who, just like the, the prey in the jaws of the tiger, the, those who have come under the glance of a guru's grace, will never be forsaken. Yet, he says, he adds, in you know, uh, the, the path shown by the Guru is essential, is necessary to follow the path shown by the Guru. So we have to continue trying. However inadequate we feel our efforts may be, however weak our love to know ourselves may be, that seed of love to know ourselves has been sown in our heart by Bhagavan. It's our responsibility to water it, to cultivate it, nurture it. So it's all in our hands. Bhagavan is giving us all the help necessary. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, in order to get the Atenyana, you need the grace of three people. You need grace of God, you need grace of Guru, one and the same, and you need the grace of the ego. Grace of God and grace of Guru is always abundant. It's the grace of ego who is lacking. Sri Ramakrishna also said that the highest thing was what he termed Vijnana. It has a different meaning in other. Yeah. And he said that the it, the ultimate state was was a perpetual oscillation between separative existence and emergence into Brahman. The the, the Brahman um, uh, became impersonal and impersonal, and
an impersonal, an impersonal, and the jiva represent uh, our experience, uh, unity and separation, the unity, like this, this perpetual pendulum swing. That means the eventual goal is duality, not non-duality. Wow. Uh, the, the thing is, he, he taught any guru, even Bhagavan, many things Bhagavan said actually contradict his central teachings. Because when people come, they, if Bhagavan says to everyone, you must uh, investigate yourself, there are people who are not ready to do that. They don't, they don't have the aspiration, they don't have the, um, they, they've got completely different goals. So the job of a guru is to bring people slowly, slowly around. Ramakrishna, he often used to talk, for instance, he often used to talk the philosophy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that's the, the dualistic. It's quite clear if you read his gospel, but that's not his own standpoint, but he assumes that standpoint to talk to certain people. But he also said, one ultimately comes to know God by trying to know who the sign is. So there's no doubt if you read his teachings carefully, his final conclusion is the same as both ones. But he talks many other things according to the needs of the people who come to him. Then there's that interaction between him and Tonka Peru, who's a really hardcore non jewelist Yeah, yeah. Yes. Like yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really hard. And Tonka uh, Peru uh, was, uh, um, was uh, always really, really had a right gun. Yeah. Well, Jim you know, Sri Ramakrishna yeah. and his attachment to Kali. Yeah. And uh, then the, at the end, you know, because there was a tradition that once you had reached complete uh, realization, then you can give up the body. Yeah. And there was this kind of, of, of amongst the really hardcore kind yeah. of non dualist yeah. yogis. So Toto Puri uh, uh, went to walk in the Ganges, and then he, <laughs> then he had a vision of Kali. Yeah. And he came out again, he was really disgruntled because he just wanted to give it all up. Yeah. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna was cracked up. Yeah. You know, he said, well, you know, you, 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 you can't, even he, he said, even you, you can't escape my mother's will. Yeah. So, it, it, so he was a really hardcore non jewish so perhaps there was some kind of uh, lesson for him to learn in, in that situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, uh, yeah, <laughs> they, uh, so long as there's a human mind, we will interpret non-dualism in our, in our own way. <laughs> so until the ego is completely destroyed, uh, it's, uh, all these differences will be there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Since then, many scholars have pondered over it. So the, what is called traditional Advaita is a mixture of the revelation of jnanas and the, the ponderings of uh, scholars. It's not so simple because that means a lot of those scholars were, were genuine spiritual aspirants. But we tend to superimpose our own ignorance on, on things. Bhagavan, that's why Bhagavan had greatly simplified things. Bhagavan generally didn't talk much about Avidya and everything. Bhagavan identified only one problem, the ego. Yeah, actually, who has Avidya? It's the ego. There's no Avidya for, for Atman. For Atmosvarupa, there's no Avidya. Avidya exists only for ego. So Avidya comes into existence only when the ego comes into existence. In fact, Avidya is just another name for ego. Maya is just another name for ego. 
all comes down to ego. So Bhagavan has, has pinpointed, this is the crux of the problem. You yourself are the crux of the problem, you yourself are the solution. So that is why it is, uh, we're very fortunate to have Bhagavan's teaching. People say, what new thing has Bhagavan brought? It's all there in the, uh, in the ancient scripture. Yes, it's all there, but mixed up with so many other things. And we can easily get ourselves confused. Bhagavan has simplified it, distilled the essence. Like from the back, we can say the whole of Vedanta is like the milky ocean. And Bhagavan has churned it and extracted the nectar. That nectar is Ulladhanapadu, Kadeshun, the Ananya. Bhagavan said that's the wrong question to first check and see if it's risen and then come back and ask me the question, Bhagavan said. Most of our questions assume that the ego has risen. Bhagavan doesn't want us to make that assumption. First, first see whether it's risen and then if you still have a problem with it, then you come back and ask me. Has anyone ever seen the ego? Has anyone ever seen the ego? No. Bhagavan says, take an alotum pinnacle. If you look for it, it disappears. It, the ego seems to exist only so long as we are aware of anything else. When we try to see the ego itself, it disappears. And what remains? When the snake disappears, what remains? Just a rope. When ego disappears, the, it's... it's Adishtana, it's Adhara, the basis of it, it remains. That is what we really are. It's so, so, so simple. But of course our mind is never satisfied with simplicity. We always want to complicate it. So <laughs> we use lots of terms, Maya and Avidya, and whether they're the same, whether Universal Avidya is Maya, whether individual Maya is Avidya, all these things, these are all the workings of, our, of the human mind. But one has brought it down to the simplest of all things. The ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If the ego does not exist, uh, nothing exists. Therefore, what is this ego? Investigate it, it disappears. That's Bhagavan's teachings in a nutshell. When we investigate, ego disappears. Yes. But he says something else will arise. So how does it know what arises? But he said, though it, arri though it arises, <laughs> that is, when Bhagavan says that something else arises, um, when the snake disappears, the rope appears. It's like saying that. The rope was always there. It's nothing new happens when the rope appears. It's just when you, well, as soon as the snake disappears, the rope remains there. So it, nothing actually happens. There's no arising. But it's just a, a way of expressing it. That's why Bhagavan said, though it appears, it is actually the whole. The whole means not only the whole in terms of it's spatially the whole, in terms of time. It's the whole, it's infinite, both, I mean, in every possible way. So when we experience that whole, there was never a time when we were not experiencing it. So when we actually, when our ego is destroyed, we will, right, there was never, a, we, we were never, this ego, we were always that, and that always experienced itself as it is. So basically, I would say there's nothing new, it's always here. Just a small change of outlook is necessary.
there is something uh, like when you when we go for a movie in the cinema theater. Yes. At the beginning, before the cinema starts, you see a blank white screen. Yes. And when the movie starts happening for the next couple of hours, we see the movie and we start emotionally reacting to every scene of the movie. Yep. And then think we want to cry, we want to get yep. angry, angry, we want to expect something to happen. Yep, exactly. But at the end of the movie, you again see the blind screen. Exactly. So the world, whatever happens in the world, it is like a movie that's happening. And as long as we know that it is not real that's happening in the world, you know that they're all not real. And you know that you should that we don't have to react to those who, happenings in the world. Who knows it's not real? That's it. The self doesn't know it at all. The self knows what is real alone is, is there. So long as you're experiencing it, you're taking yourself to be a person. So it is an unreal person who is saying, I know it's unreal. We don't know it's unreal. We, so long as we're experiencing the dream, the dream seems real. What would be the fun of going to a cinema if we don't believe it? We know in, in the back of our mind that it's just a film. Then why do we get so emotional about it, about some lights flashing on a screen? Because we're not seeing lights flashing on a screen. We're seeing real live events, and we're involved in it completely. That's why it has emotional effect on us. No, that comes because of the possession of those emotions and thoughts. You are possessive of the thoughts of anger, possessive of thoughts of uh, 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 compassion, anything that happens in the movie. Or the yes, movie. but in, in the movie you've got the, you've got the screen is outside. But according to Bhagavan, all the pictures we are seeing on this screen of life are thoughts. There's no world apart from thought. It's all thought. And when you possess the thought, your ego builds. And when you exactly. don't possess it, then the ego goes away, right? Yes. Because the ego cannot arise in isolation. We can never experience... The ego is the first thought. But this first thought is a mixture even within this first thought, there's a second thought there. The ego is the thought, I am this body. The body is another thought. So it's, we can never be thought free so long as we experience ourselves as the ego. The ego never stands alone. That's why so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we're experiencing ourselves as ego. If we try to see this ego, in other words, if we stop seeing anything else and try to see ego alone, ego vanishes. People talk and say, I was meditating and for five minutes I had no thoughts. The I who had no thoughts for five minutes is itself a thought. The five minutes for which it had no thoughts is itself a all thought. So we are deluding ourselves when we think that we experience thoughtlessness in meditation. If we really experience thoughtlessness in meditation, we wouldn't come out of the meditation again. That would be the end of it. There are two states, possible states of thoughtlessness. One is manolaya, which is like sleep. Sleep is a state of manolaya. Or manonasa. So long as uh, in manolaya, that you will be completely in a state like sleep. But we won't say that's of no use at all. We sleep every night, but we don't get any closer to jnana as a result of it. Because the, though in, in sleep what happens, or in any safe layer, the big shaper, the, the projection, the multiplicity, is temporarily stopped. But the underlying darkness remains. That the, uh, Avarana. So that, that, that's like the darkness in the cinema. So if, if uh, in the intervals, if the projector stops and the lights don't come on, we're just in darkness. So we can't go and buy our popcorn. So, uh, <laughs> so you get like sleep. We can't make any progress in sleep. So it's only in the 
in states where in waking and dream, which is basically all the same state, it's only in that waking dream state, and dream or waking, or whatever we choose to call it, it's only in that state that we can make effort. So, so long as we're experiencing um, the shaper, this multiplicity, we should try to investigate who is experiencing it. The ruling does all this occur. And that way we'll pierce through the mano layer, go direct to mano nasa. The key to that mano, uh, mano nasa is I, the ego. See it, it disappears. Okay, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, if you look at the Vedanta, where this old oh, Yajur Veda, yes. uh, uh, in Hindu philosophy, uh, it says that everything in the world created, uh, the, the God is there in that, right? God, God is there in the living and non-living. Yes. It's there in the light, it's there in the warmth, it's there in the dust, it's there yes. in the shirt, what you wear, it's there yes. everywhere. So when it is everywhere there, when I am here and you are being, when I hear me become same, then you become same, then you keep on realizing that you are connecting yourself with everything as identical, right? A becomes A. A doesn't become B, A doesn't look at C as C or B as D. Everything C becomes A or A becomes C. So everything becomes one. And then you see that everywhere spiritually that your ego is not, there's no room for creation of ego, ego because your that person converging with everything okay. as a Shiva in yeah. okay. in, 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 in the Upanishads it said all all is uh, all is Brahma. Bhagavan has not contradicted that, but he's given her, he has refined that teaching. Where the Upanishads say all is Brahman, Bhagavan says all is ego. Handeya Yagama. It seems to be two completely opposite things. It's not actually opposite, the, the, the two can be reconciled. But what Bhagavan has taught us is a crucial to understand. And wait, if we think all this is Brahman, it's just a thought, it's just an imagination. If we think all this is ego, then who am I? We turn our attention back to I, ego disappears, all disappears, what remains is Brahman. Then what was it that appeared as all? Obviously it can only be Brahman, because Brahman alone actually exists. Brahman means our own self, Atmasarupa. So he, the ultimate, uh, what he, ultimately everything is Brahman, but the intermediate thing that gives rise to all, and the, the, of which, the intermediate thing of which all is an expansion is the ego. So, um, that's why like Bhagavan teachings are so, so practical, by like bringing it back to the ego. Bhagavan, uh, like, a, like a great doctor, he's identified the exact cause of the disease. He's not interested in the symptoms, whether you've got headache or toothache, it doesn't matter. He found the root, and he wants you to tackle the root. So, throw away all the Vedanta, Vedas, everything. Problem is I, deal with the I, and then all the babies will be in your fingertips. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, um, you know, when we talk about Mano Leia, Mano Nasha. Yes. In deep sleep, there's Mano Leia, and it springs forth again, or yes. the tendency to dormant. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm just sort of interested in what is actually happening there because is the, the body is still functioning, the heart is still functioning. Something is gone to sleep, but something is still awake. That's very interesting. You're aware of your body and heart and everything. No, no, asleep. I'm not, no, I'm not aware. So, so, I, so if if we say that the ego <coughs> has gone and then the heart, I'm not experiencing the heartbeat and whatever, then what is happening? And then is that a different, then when I wake up, is that something? No, nothing is happening in sleep. In sleep there is no body, no world, nothing. So the heart is also stopped? 
Well, heart, heart doesn't exist at all yeah. in sleep. There's, there's nothing in sleep. There's but then, but then those seeds exist. Seeds, yeah. But even that is because it comes back in the waking state. We have to. This is a. This is an idea we have in the waking state. To explain how we come back, we say we remain in a seed form yeah. in sleep. But this is just to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. In the waking state. But let's forget about it. Sometimes it's useful to reflect on our experience in sleep, to understand that we are not this body. But beyond that, we can forget about our experience in sleep. What are we now itself? The problem is this ego which has risen now. Let's but, but tackle see, this ego. So this, and yes, I'm tackling the ego again only in one of the three states. I mean, I'm okay. tackling it at the waking state. Again. Yes, but that's sufficient. The ego, is, the ego is no problem in sleep, is it? It doesn't give trouble you in sleep. But then, okay, I, the seeds are right. Even if you say the seeds are only you know, from an explanation from the waking yes. state. But then you come back again. Yes, but... Now, now you have a problem. Ego is here now. Yeah. So, uh, what? It's only here and now that you can tackle this ego. Yeah. We can't tackle the ego when we're asleep. We can't tackle it. We, I can't tackle it five minutes ago. I can't tackle it five minutes hence. I can only tackle it now. Yeah. So that's moment to moment. We are faced with a choice: Do we want to experience ourselves, or do we want to experience other things? Well, let's say our self and other things, because we're never not experiencing ourselves. We're always self-aware. But do we want to be aware of our self alone, or do we want to be aware of our self plus other things? We are constantly choosing to be aware of our self plus other things. But one says, try to be aware of yourself and see what happens. Try to be aware of yourself alone and see what happens. So it's only at this, this precise moment now that we can tackle it. The future moment and the past moment are just ideas in the present. Um, just to come back on that, um, are you, did you say that nothing exists in sleep? Yes. So that means ego doesn't exist in sleep? Yes. And if ego doesn't exist, nothing exists. And nothing exists. But don't you also say somewhere that we are aware when we're asleep, when we're asleep? Who is aware? It is well, our self as we really are, not our self as we are. The self as we really are yes. knows that we're, uh, we're asleep. It doesn't know we're asleep, it knows I am. It knows I am. <laughs> it's only in the wake, when we come to waking state, when we think I was asleep, has anyone ever experienced I am asleep? No. We experience, we have a memory, I was sin I was asleep, we say. Have you ever had that? If someone were to say I am asleep, we well, would laugh at them. It would be obviously have, absurd. Can we have a memory of sleep? Or yes, can we? we can, we can. So but we can have a memory what you were saying there was we have we can have a memory of nothing. Um, not a memory of nothing, we have a memory of our, of our soul. But it's not actually a memory. Because we are, we are constantly aware of our soul, this, that self-awareness, the I am, is a constant thread through all the states. So, the, where is the... Um, to remember anything other than our soul, we need a mind. To remember our self-awareness, we don't need a mind, because the self-awareness is, is the, the one thread underlying, running through all these states. All right, so isn't that something that's existing? I am. Yes, it's the only thing that's existing. So it's, it's, it's not strictly speaking correct for me to say, um, in sleep there is nothing. Or there is nothing means there is nothing other than I. The difference is we come out of sleep. 
So the problem is not the sleep itself, the problem is the coming out of it. self-realized now as you were in sleep. Even now, according to Bhagavan, we're all fully self-realized. What, self what does self-realization mean? It means to be aware of ourselves. Is there ever a moment when we're not aware of ourselves? Bhagavan said, no realization is necessary. The problem is, we have realized the unreal. So we, if we unrealize the unreal, that is what is called realization. But when you're enough English to play with English in that way. This word realization is a, is a rather unfortunate word. It really doesn't... Uh, um, if you ask psychologists what uh, self-realization means, they have a completely different... It's a very, very ambiguous term, self-realization. The term that generally used in Sanskrit is jnana, atma jnana. And Bowen says jnana is what we actually are. Jnana mamtane me, he says in verse 13 of Ulrich Nathu, our, our self which is knowledge alone is real. Our self which is jnana alone is real. So when we, are, we, are, we are the jnana. So it's not something we are to attain. We just get rid of everything else and we remain in the jnana that we always are. Yeah. But um, it's, it's very difficult not to, to see it something to be attained because... But this, this is the nature of the mind. Because, because yeah, yeah it, it, and from, from the perspective of the mind, we, we, we do think of it in terms of something to be attained. But Bowen tries to refine our understanding. It's not something that we newly to attain. The attainment is getting rid of things. It's not yeah. gaining anything new. Yeah. In, Bowen doesn't experience any, anything that we don't experience. In fact, he experiences less than we experience. The problem is, if we could get rid of everything that we experience, other than what Bhagavan experiences, then we would be in the same state as Bhagavan. Yes. So, so um, when we're in deep sleep, are we in the same state as Bhagavan? I've got full, full self-knowledge. Even now, even now you're in the same state. The, the yeah, we just don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, 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 the mind cannot understand this. Because yeah. so long as we try to... But one thing is, one thing is absolutely certain. We are jnana, the jnana is always here. The problem is, something has been superimposed on this jnana. That thing superimposed on jnana is the ego. So let's investigate the ego, but when it says we investigate it, it disappears, and what remains is jnana. I hear him now. I think that's absolutely true. And the only thing I 
So the whole karma theory, without a gamya, which means a fresh karma we are doing, but using our own volition. So we, we have what, is, what we are destined to experience, we will experience. But we have free will. I was to submit to that, to accept whatever we are destined to experience, or to, uh, to try to avoid it. Or to, or to try to explain things which we're not destined to explain. We have that freedom. Bhagavan says that this body and this brain are inclusive. Yes. Then, would its free will be equally inclusive? Is it free will in the brain or is it in you? <laughs> it's we who have free will. The brain has no will of its own. The brain is just a piece of, uh, of matter. It has no. no 
we, we, conf we confuse mind and brain. Brain is just a, an instrument, like the eye or something. It's uh, I mean, like the physical eye. It's, uh, it's just, the physical eye is not, the physical eye doesn't see anything. It is the channel through which we see things. Brains in mind, yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. The whole universe is in the mind, according to Bhagavan. Could you explain uh, echo dreaming? I never really understood it. You touched upon it. When you're dreaming, you see many people in the dream. You have conversations with them. Uh, for example, we may be dreaming now. You may wake up in five minutes. When you wake up, do you, are you concerned about all the people you, uh, um, supposing we are, um, we are, we are shipwrecked and we are stranded at sea somewhere in, in your dream and then suddenly you wake up, do you worry whether all the people who you left behind in the dream, whether they are going to reach safety or not? No, because as soon as you wake up, you understand, you, Though there seem to be many people experiencing that dream, so long as you were experiencing it, once you wake up, you realize they were all part of your dream. But you are the only one experiencing it. Likewise, you are the only one experiencing this now. Other people here may object to that. How are Alex is the only person experiencing it? We all in Alex is the It's not like that. Well, when, when, when there was some talk about this in Bhagavan's Hall, and uh, um, someone asked Bhagavan, then Bhagavan, who is, all, among all of us here, who is the Ekajiva? <laughs> Bhagavan said, you are that. Akhil Masi. And someone else said, Bhagavan, what about me? You are that. <laughs> we each experience, how many egos do we experience? Only one. We, we, we infer, because we see other bodies, look behave more or less like ours, the talk and walk and uh, seem to enjoy, seem to uh, experience pleasure, pain, all these things. We infer that there's an, an ego in that body which is experiencing just as we're experiencing. That all seems real so long as we're dreaming. When I wake up to the reality, if I realize that I never do. Yes. And you don't realize that the um, meal is going to be Yeah, exactly. The room here ever has been done. Yeah. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> but as I say, we shouldn't misapply that by trying to apply it in action. We shouldn't think, oh, I'm the only one, I'm the only uh, one experiencing all this, so it doesn't matter if my neighbor's starving. It doesn't matter because your neighbor is as real as the Alistair who you experience yourself to be. So if you've got, uh, if you've got only one plate of food and your neighbor is starving, you share half the, or if you've had a meal with you, you give him the whole plate, or at least half the plate you give him. But that, it's all in the dream. Why Bhagavan teaches this, that the world is a dream, why he teaches Ekajiva Bhaga is not to change our outward behavior, but to encourage us to turn within to investigate who is this one ego who is experiencing all this.
the I in Mozart who composed all that music is the same I in you. In that sense, yes, but you you can't be Mo you can't be Mozart and Shakespeare at the same time. <laughs> because you I is always one. So you have to choose. Who do you want to be now? <laughs> I could choose to imagine myself. Well, in the previous uh, dream, I was known as that. Quite possibly. But I'm quite sure I wasn't Mozart, because if I had been Mozart, I'm sure I'd have a little bit more musical ability than I have. <laughs> I may be, it may have been Shakespeare because I can write a lot of words. <laughs> That's my only talent. Can you ask about Ajata? Ajata. Yes. Bowman didn't actually teach Ajata. He intimated us that the final experience is Ajata. But for his teaching, he took, he came down one level to what is called Vivartavada. Vivarta means, uh, uh, Vivarta means illusion or false, a false appearance. <clears throat> because we see that he begins the very first words of the first verse of the main text of Rules and Aptis, Namo Lohu Kandula, because we see the world. That's already stepping down from Ajata. Within Ajata there's no ego, no world, nothing has ever happened. But when one steps down, because we experience the world, he has to come down to our level. Because our experience completely, Ajata is a complete uh, contradiction of our experience. And our experience is a complete contradiction of our agenda. So Bhagavan has to compromise. His viewpoint and our viewpoint are so completely different, he comes down and says, he accepts our viewpoint where all this seems to exist. He says, how it seems to exist? Because you rise as an ego. When you don't rise as an ego in sleep, you don't experience any of this. When you rise as an ego, wake in your dream, you experience all this. Problem is therefore your ego. Investigate the ego. See whether the ego is real. Since all this is experienced by the ego, its seeming existence is dependent upon the seeming existence of the ego. If we investigate the ego, we'll find there is no such thing at all. There never has been an ego. When, they, when there has never been an experiencer, there has never been any experience. So logically, we must come ultimately to a jatta, even though it completely contradicts our experience. Either we have to say the ego is real, or we have to say if the ego is unreal, then all that the experience is also unreal. So ultimately, that is the final experience, but it's not useful for teaching. It's useful to some extent to have that intimation, so we don't get into... It, it cuts most of, a lot of our questions short. That's why Bowen, when people ask um, how all this comes into existence, why is there Maya, all these sort of questions, Bowen used to say, to whom are all these things? It's to you as an ego. See if this ego is real. So asking how or why is the wrong question. The right question is, who am I? Who is it? To whom all these things seem to exist? You mentioned that <coughs> witnessing thoughts is not about sensitive body. No. And that the other uh, features like the uh, community or the uh, Yes. I don't say we should, we, we should, there's only one thought we should witness. 
According to Bhagavad Gita, the only thing we should witness is the witness. We shouldn't witness and if by witness we mean observe, yes. in that sense, we should observe the observer. We shouldn't observe anything else. Because it is by observing anything other than ourselves that we rise as this ego. Other things seem to exist only in the view of the ego. What are the differences that we use between um, in some respects, the Sagadas teachings seem very similar to Bhagavan. But as some of the things that he recommended, like such a witness in thoughts, is diametrically opposite to what Bhagavan said. Bhagavan said, don't follow the thoughts. Don't. Whatever thought may occur, to, uh, investigate to whom it occurs. Turn your attention back within. So Bhagavan, uh, 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 what Bhagavan taught is that we should observe only the observer, nothing else. Because it, 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 uh, that's why the two of the most crucial verses in Urugnaftu are verses 25 and 26. 25 it says, grasping form, it, uh, it rises. Uh, grasping form, it stands. Uh, grasping and feeding on forms, it waxes and grows strong. Uh, leaving one form, it grasps another form. But if sought, it takes flight. Such is the nature of this formless ego. When he says, describes the ego as formless, therefore form is anything other than itself. So what the implication of that term urupatri, grasping form, is experiencing anything other than itself. So long as the ego experiences anything other than itself, it rises, it stands, and it is fed. So uh, awareness of other things is the food of the ego. Self-awareness is the death of the ego. That it's okay, self-awareness is fine, so long as it mixes with awareness of other things. But if we try to be aware of our self alone, ego vanishes. Take in our own and critical. It's sought, it takes flight. That is the, that's the fundamental principle of Bhagavan teaching. And how these other things, these forms of the ego is grasping, how they come into existence? Are they waiting there for the ego to rise and grasp them? No, according to Bhagavan. The ego comes into existence, all these forms come into existence. That's the next verse, verse 26. If ego, hande yung dain and eight yung dain. If ego rises, everything rises. If the ego is not, everything is not. Ego is therefore everything. Therefore, investigating what is this ego is giving up everything. When, when you investigate what is the ego, ego will, di will disappear. When the ego disappears, everything disappears. Those two verses, if we understand those, it saves us from so many um, from being a, uh, led astray in so many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did, um, did the Bhagavan dissuade people from, um, as part of their process of Disidentification from from thought or this this distinction of thing that we call self, the, the fake self, the, the shimmer. Um, did he completely dissuade people from allowing the thoughts to arise without becoming identified with them? It's a lot of the neo Vedanta crew doing that, you know, and, and, and it's good stuff. You know, it, 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 you know, it's, it's part of the crime. Some of this quite good advice that Eckhart Tolle were able to, to uh, communicate some sense of that. Did Bhagavan completely dissuade people from that process? Bhagavan didn't dissuade anyone from anything. If people wanted to do something, like a, a, a nice example, when 
Kapi Yagan Thayer came to Bhagavan. Uh, well, he, uh, he had seen Bhagavan before, he knew about Bhagavan, but he hadn't actually come to him for advice. One day when he was, uh, when he was feeling dejected, because after all his years of mantra japa and so many different types of tapas, he didn't feel he had got all the powers and other things that he wanted. He felt dejected, so he came to Bhagavan and he asked, Bhagavan, I've done so many crores of japa, I've done um, so many other types of austerity, uh, fasting and this and that, but still I don't know what is tapas. Please, please enlighten me, what is tapas? But one first answer was to keep quiet. For about 20 minutes or so, but one didn't answer anything. Then Kamiyanti said, but when I read about such Mona Diksha, such uh, teaching through silence, in books, but I'm not able to understand it. So please tell me in words. Then the first advice Bhagavan gave is, uh, if one sees where what says I, I arises, for so coming up to saying, I've done this, I've done that. So if one sees what it, if one observes what it is, uh, what is that which says I, 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 there the mind will subside. That is tapas. Then this was something completely new to him because he was used to all the mantras and tantras and all these sort of things. So he had, Bhagavan, can, is it not possible to attain the same by mantra japa? Then Bhagavan says, if you attend to the, uh, to the where from the sound of the mantra arises, there the mind will subside, that is tapas. Bhagavan's first uh, response was silence, which is his highest teaching, his real teaching. We cannot understand his silence. So he comes down one level and teaches us um, to investigate the eye. If we are wise, we take that advice and we stick to that. But many people are not ready, they, they're not ready to do this. So they are, can I not uh, do the same through mantra or tantra or japa or puja or all these other things? If they ask like that, even then, but, but, but doesn't want them to go too far away. So he says, yes, you do your japa, but see from where the sound of the mantra arises. From where did the sound of the mantra arise? From I, obviously. The mantra sound doesn't come to them, so it comes from me. So indirectly, Bhagavan giving the same teaching in a different way. So Bhagavan did sometimes uh, concede to people uh, and if it, if Bhagavan, if people say, well, Bhagavan, this self-inquiry is much too difficult for me. Can I not do Jaffa instead? Bhagavan's not going to say, no, you must do it. Obviously, they're not going to do it. But they've already decided that it's not it's too difficult for them. And Bhagavan said, yes, carry on with whatever you're doing. So Bhagavan didn't dissuade people, but he did, for those people who really want to understand, he not only explain the practice, he explained the reason for the practice. Why this self-investigation is the only way? Because so long as we are aware of anything other than I, we are feeding the ego. If we want to free ourselves from this ego, the only way is to, is to attend to the ego alone. Because the ego rises by attending to other things, it will subside only by attending to itself. So he, he he not only shows the way, he explains why this is efficacious. If you understand that, then we will understand why Bhagavan said, it doesn't matter how many thoughts arise. Whenever any thought arises, if you investigate to whom it arises, your mind will turn back to yourself. And that thereby uh, uh, destroy every thought in the very place of rising. In other words, don't give room to the rising of any thought, so that we attend to ourselves, not even the ego can arise. That will own our thoughts. Right. 
what is bhakti? Bhakti uh, simply means love. We can express love in many ways. Bhagavan has said the best expression of love. What, what is it? Um, so long as we think God is something other than ourselves, we are loving divided between ourselves and God. But we all love ourselves. Why are we worshipping God? Because we think he's kind to us. So the, the, the self-love is always there, even in the bhakti. So um, you will forget your idea, but one has explained different types of practices, like karma, which we can do in the name of bhakti, like uh, puja, japa, dhyana. That's um, uh, worship by body, worship by speech, but japa, repetition, or whatever, and um, dhyana, worship by mind. He, he grades all these according to an order of efficacy. Each one, better from puja is japa. I mean, among the different types of japa, he classifies different types. Better than singing hymns of praise, uh, uh, japa is good. Better than, um, uh, than japa done aloud, japa done uh, quietly within the mouth is good. Better than japa done within the mouth, mental japa is good. Uh, that is uh, dhyana, that's meditation. Then, among different types of meditation, better than meditation that's interrupted by other thoughts, meditation that is continuous is good. So he, he graded them. But, in verse 8 of Upadesha, he comes to a crucial point, rather, anya bhavati navanavama ahum ananya bhavama yonipara anetina ultima mundipara. That means, rather than uh, Anya Baba means taking God to be other than ourselves. Anya means other, what is other. So Anya Baba means take, make, taking of God as if he's something other than ourselves. Rather than that, Ananya Baba, that's take, uh, meditating on him as not other than ourselves. In other words, meditating on ourselves alone. And he adds there, in which he is I. That means when there's no longer a separate he, then he becomes I, and we meditate on I alone. That is the implication. And he says, anatinam utrama mandipara. All the forms of bhakti, all the practices of bhakti, that is the highest. What he calls there, what he describes there as ananya, bhakti, ananya bhava, is, is, is just another way of describing the practice of self-investigation. It's observing ourselves. And in other verses, he in one verse he uh, said, um, um, Atmana Santam Atu Parami Sabakti, Isan uh, Tanai, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but what it means is um, self investigation is if, a if, uh, if supreme devotion to God because God exists as oneself. If you read the verses of of, um, of Arunachal Sutta Panishkam, you will see there that Anya Baba and Yananya Baba are beautifully blended together. That is, he's mixing in the jnana and the dualistic bhakti together. Because in actual practice, though we may aspire to practice only self-investigation in order to investigate ourselves, we are all um, we all have our weaknesses. We, we, we still are attached to ourselves as a person. So we keep on slipping down from that state of pure self-awareness and experiencing ourselves as a person in this world. And we we are very painfully aware of our inadequate love to experience ourselves alone. So in our desperation, we sometimes turn to God in prayer, as if God is someone other than ourselves. But if we read, uh, there's double meaning in almost all the verses in the Who is our natural? Is our natural just the form of the hill? 
Yes, it is the form of the hill, but that is an outward manifestation of the real our natural, which is within us as I. So we, Bhagavan blends it, if, we un, if we've understood Bhagavan's core teachings, and then we read our natural speech punishment, it's very, very clear what is happening. It is the condition of the, of the jiva, the soul, when it is trying to cling to itself, but keeps on coming, being swept out by its vasanas, and uh, then praying to its own self projected out with it as a god in the form of this hill. It is uh, it's, it's, it's the journey of the soul, basically, on the path of self-investigation. In Street Punishment, it's very clear, but dualistic devotion, Bhagavan says in verse 8 of the Pradesh India, what he implies is the non-dualistic devotion, devotion to God as I alone, that is the highest of all. But because we are not able to be in that state all the time, we, it, it, it's perfectly legitimate to pray to God. Because when we pray to God, so long, not, Bhagavan doesn't recommend praying for health, wealth, and all these, any external things. He only recommends praying for the annihilation of ego, for ever increasing love for him. So, um, it, it's, when, we, when we pray to God for the annihilation of our ego, we are channeling our love for that. So, it, it, it's not, um, it, it, we are focusing our love, as it were. And that makes it easier for us to turn back within. So it's all, it's all a process. But what we should always be aiming for, what the Bhagavan says, I'm not going to him, what at the verse 44 of Akshan I was quoting earlier. Daily turning within, see yourself with the inner eye. That's what we should be, that is the best form of bhakti. But we fail in that if we pray to them. And we fail all the time. And we will continue failing all the time until there's only we will only succeed once. And that will be the final. by the heart. The heart is not a physical place. Not yeah, yeah. No. Heart means ourself. Heart means what is the center. The center of everything is ourself. So, uh, and within the center of ourself, there's perfect silence. So only when we rise as an ego, all noise originates from the ego. The ego is the first noise. Or was it ego's first thought? Thought it, it, all not all all thought is noise. So the silence of the heart is the, is the state of of, um, of of pure self-awareness. Self-awareness where not even the slightest thought arises. That is the silence of the heart. So being in ourself as ourself, that is being in the silence of the heart. No, no, it won't. Because we're trying to separate ourselves from the body. The body is a thought, so it's part of the noise. Yes. <laughs> the reason Bhagavan mentioned this heart on the right hand side, it wasn't of his own accord, his own volition that he mentioned any place in the body. Bhagavan often used to talk about heart, and he always said that heart means self. Atman alone is heart. But um, he also he he also was um, this is a very very subtle subject we're talking about. So no words can adequately um, can adequately convey what Bhagavan is trying to convey to us. So he often spoke in metaphors. So he, heart, we can say, is a metaphor for ourselves. And so he, he used to say, um, 
all thoughts arise from the heart, meaning all thoughts arise from myself. All thoughts, including the ego, the first thought, they all arise from myself, the heart. Kariyagantha and his followers, they were all very much into practicing yoga and all this, these type of things. So when Bhagavan spoke about the heart, they kept on asking him, where in the body is the heart? Is it the same as the Anahata Chakra? Or where is it? Bhagavan said, no, it's not the same as the Anahata Chakra. Then where is it? Bhagavan said, the heart is the soul. It's not, it's not got a location here or there. But Bhagavan, you say all thoughts arise from the heart. And we know from our own experience that thoughts arise in the body. So there must be some place in the body where all thoughts arise. That must be the place of the heart. Bhagavan was resisting that question. I mean, he, was, he kept on saying, no, it's only from yourself. But because they continued insisting, eventually Bhagavan said, if at all you want to say a place in the body where everything, all thoughts rise, including the ego, it seems to be from the heart on the right hand on the hand side of the chest. The reason, uh, the reason for pointing out that place is when we refer to ourselves, we point to... If you say, I, I give a sum in record time, you don't say, I give a sum in record time, you say, I give a sum in record time. And if you say, I'll run to the post office, we don't point to our foot, we we'll say, I'll run to the post office. So, it, that is the... We all experience that is the center of ourself. Within, with relation in relation to the body, that is. But Bhagavan has said the body itself is a thought. So a, a location for, the, so, for ourself within the body is also a thought. So it was not... Oh, but then when Bhagavan said this, they then said, oh, but we haven't read in any of the uh, scriptures about this. How come, how come this has never been written in any scriptures? Bhagavan said, it's not been written there, but it really doesn't matter. They said, no, 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 it must, uh, there must be some authority for it. Then one day, Bhagavan happened to be given uh, some book of Malayalam, uh, Malayalam translation of Ashtanga Hidiyam, which is uh, an ancient Sanskrit work on Ayurvedic medicine. And he, while flipping through that, he happened to see two verses in which it is described, the, the six things inside the chest of different colors, and one of them is the heart. And it, it, so Bhagavan saw that, and he translated those two verses into Tamil, just to point out from C. It is said there in the ancient texts. I'm not the only one who says this. People later made a lot of it. The, the first place, if you, you read all of Bhagavan's book, the earliest place where it's mentioned about the heart on the right-hand side is in chapter 5 of Ramana Gita. Because it was when they were trying to get Bhagavan to tell them, they, they, that was when he first said it. And later he came across his verse and he translated those. But when people later asked him, should I meditate on the right hand side of the chest in order to meditate on the heart? In talks there's one passage where he's very, very clear. He said meditation should not be on the right or left. Meditation should be on my hand, that sort of thing. That in talk there's just one example, but that's something Bhagavan, people often ask Bhagavan that, and he will always insist, no, it's not a place for meditation. It's of no spiritual significance, it's only with relation to the body. heart, basically. Um, it is sometimes used in the sense of a physical blood propelling organ, but that's not the primary meaning. It's used in the sense of, like we, we talk of, um, in English we, we use heart in so many, we're not, we don't always talk just about the physical organ. If we say, oh, David Cameron's got no heart the way he's refusing to let in refugees, we're not talking about his physical blood propelling organ. We, we, he's got no compassion. We use it in, the, in a metaphorical sense in English, in exactly the same way it's used in Sanskrit. Um, sometimes when, he, in one context, Bhagavan did say, because hridayam means heart, 
the hit also means half. That is just the first half of the word. Ayam can mean this. So this is the center. But it's just, um, Hrit is actually an abbreviation of Hridayam. So Ibogo was just playing with words when he said this is, Hridayam means this, the center this, this is the center. He was just, uh, he was just playing with the words, how you can interpret them in different ways. But uh, and that, that's just a word. That's not what's important. What's important is that Bogo means by heart, is the center that is our self. It's not a physical location. The whole universe is in the heart, according to one one. How can all that be contained in this little point to the right in the center of the chest? And if this is the heart, then what about in dream? I also used to punch myself in, like this in dream, but that was a different body. So which which is the real heart? This 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 heart or that heart? It's uh, it's all. <laughs> But probably some people are either unable or unwilling to go beyond thinking in terms of body. When Bhagavan's fundamental teaching is, I am not this body. So it's not that we're not questioning ourselves in terms of like a, as a thought. We're not repeating the thought, who am I? What one means by who am I is we're investigating what you decide. So who am I and self-investigation or self-meditation, they're all it means exactly the same thing. And only when we since if we attend to anything other than I, other than ourselves, we rise as an ego. So in order to be in a state of sumayiru, just being, we have to attend only to I. So it's all, it's not three different methods, it's three ways of describing the same method. There is only one method. It can be described in so many different ways. But the method is one. Method is, uh, is, is just being self-attentive or being authentically self-aware. We're always self-aware, but we're aware of ourself plus other things at the moment. We try to be aware of ourself alone by trying to focus our attention on our self-awareness. Subside. And the only way for the ego to subside, he describes that in the first sentence of that paragraph, um, uh, um, remaining in uh, as an atman, remaining in atmanishta, self abidance, without giving room to a, uh, the slightest room to the rising of any thought other than atmachintana. Atmachintana means 
self thought or self meditation or self attentiveness. Don't give you room to arrive at any thought other than self attentiveness. That is giving oneself to God. Because as he says in verse 26 of, of uh, Ulitunaptu, investigating what it is, that what the ego is, is giving up everything. The ego included. So only by attending to ourself alone are we really surrendering ourselves to God. So does that verse only apply? How, how does that apply to the real terms in practical life? How can I let God do my thinking and my feeling in, in, in real practical terms? By not rising as an ego, instead of so long as you so long as you're attending to what's going on outside, you're rising as an ego. When you rise as an ego, you experience yourself as a doer. When you rise as an ego, then you take the, the body and mind as yourself. Whatever the body and mind does, you feel, I am doing this. So there wouldn't be any thinking of doing that anyway. So how can you think of doing those things are absent? It's a way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, the same thing can be said in terms of no, no way in which we express this can be adequate. There's a loophole in everything. We have to go beyond the word, we have to see where the words are pointing. When the finger is pointing at the moon, we shouldn't be looking at the finger, we should be looking at the moon. The, the, the word teachings are like the finger, where is it pointing at? Yes. Uh, do the awareness on a continuous basis there are certain constraints practically we get in life, right? Because you know, if you are, if all of us observe, most of our time uh, we spend on food, comfort, security, and all that we as a function of money, and then we keep worried about that most of us awaken in time. <laughs> right? Yeah. And this, this three, I guess to broadly categorize, that is a constraint always coming in, uh, you know, stopping the continuous flow of self-awareness. So is it something that to do the self-awareness, we should give up the physical uh, possessions and keep a very simplistic life without worry of any of these things? It certainly helps if we, if we can live a, outwardly a simpler life. It, it does help things. It does, does help. But what sort of life we are going to live outwardly is actually not in our hands, it's already destined. And what, what we are destined to experience, we, if we really have faith in the words of Bhagavan, if we have faith in what Bhagavan says in that note to his mother, we would understand that whatever we are destined to experience will come to us, come what may. And he will make our body when he says uh, in the first sentence, uh, according to the character of each person, God being there, there will make them act. What is it that acts? It's the body and the mind and the speech. Only if we take this body, mind and speech to our, be ourselves do we feel I am doing this. So we are free even now to uh, to turn our attention away from all these things back towards ourself. That is what he says in the last sentence. Are they ete nandru? Being silent is good. Being silent means turning our attention within. Why we don't turn our attention within, we say it's because of these constraints, because we need food, clothing, shelter, and money, and all the security, all these things. This is just an excuse. We, because we are more interested in these things than we are in experiencing ourselves alone, 
we say, oh, because I have to earn money and because I have to do all these things, I don't have time for this, or I've only got a little bit of time for it. Even if everything was provided for us, we would still not be doing this because we, we are not yet interested enough. <laughs> Let's face it, none of us really have, we may have a little bit of bhakti, but we, none of us have adequate bhakti. None of us have, I think, the other side of bhakti is their idea. None of us have adequate their idea. We are much more interested in our life as a person than we are in experiencing what we really are. If we want to experience what we really are, we can experience here and now. Nothing is obstructing us. The only thing that's obstructing us is we don't want it. So we have to cultivate that liking. How we cultivate that liking? By trying, by practicing, practicing, practicing. And by trying again and again and failing a thousand times, but getting up and trying again, not a thousand times, a thousand core of times. We, uh, it doesn't matter how many times we fail, so long as we continue trying, sooner or later we will succeed. I mean, the amount we try is the measure of the amount of bhakti we really have. Bhakti is not going to the temple and lighting camphor and all these things. That's, that's a show of bhakti, but that's not the real bhakti. The real bhakti is constantly trying to turn our mind within to experience ourselves alone. Unmindful of the needs of our body or anything. If we really have faith in God, if we really have faith in Bhagavan's words, we will leave all these things to him. We feel it's our responsibility. I have to earn money. I have to look after my family. I have to do this. I have to do that. But the belief is that uh, for a common man like, like me, if I have to say that I follow the surrender path, who, Sarvagadi, who said you, say, Who said you're a common man first? No, I can say, uh, like, like uh, you know, at the beginning, beginner, beginner stage, who says you're a beginner? Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a combination of surrender, all your worries and future to God, say the way yeah. life comes and I'm going to take it, I'm not going to bother good and bad. Yeah. And then, in parallel, follows self realization awareness. That means that if you are giving away all that worries and all the future, you are keeping that away. So, you have more and more time to do self awareness. That, that kind of approach gives you enough time to be more practicing yeah, the, right, the yeah. in, in practice, because we, if, if we uh, acknowledge the fact that we, why we're not succeeding, it is simply because we don't yet have enough bhakti, we've got to cultivate the bhakti. The way to cultivate the bhakti is by persevering and trying. And um, Self-investigation and self-surrender, they're two sides of the same coin. The more we attend to ourselves, the more our ego subsides, the more we are really surrendering ourselves to God. Why Bhagavan says about leaving everything in the hands of God and everything, if we have that attitude that God will take care of all these things, we've got that faith, that trust, that will make it so much easier for us to turn within. If we constantly, if we doubt God, is God really going to look after me, or is He going to leave me in the lurch? That's He's just cheating me. So long as we've got that sort of doubt lurking in our mind, which all of us have, let's be honest, we may not put it in so many words, but do any of us really trust God? If we really trusted God, we need not worry about all these things. We've all got our worry because we don't trust God. It's very, very nice to talk about faith in God, but none of us have it. Bhagavan no has given us something but at least we can be really clear and clear that we can try and do, to try and investigate ourselves. By trying to investigate ourselves, we'll purify our mind, we'll get the clarity of mind and heart in which faith in God will automatically blossom. Just telling people, oh, have faith in God, what good does that do? I'd love to have faith in God, but the fact is I don't. That's why I'm worrying about my little life as a, a small person, and I'm, I, I'm miserable because of that, because of my lack of faith in God. But I can't get faith in God just because I say, oh, faith in God, it's good to have faith in God. 
we all have this idea it's good to have faith in God, but we don't have faith in God. Or well, we've got a little bit, but grossly inadequate faith. So what do you do when you're close to <laughs> you try to investigate who is it who's got a grossly inadequate faith. <laughs> yes. But you don't you don't satisfy yourself by saying me of course. Who is this me? Go on persevering in trying to find out who is this me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean I wonder if inspiration, you know, in the form of uh, say some biblical quotes or you know, some trust in the law for the law by now, yeah. being not so uh, an understanding, you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, is this kind of inspiration to the Christian Yeah. Um, so, I, I want to refer to you that uh, give us a kick start. Yeah, it, it, might, it might help to a little extent. <clears throat> until you suddenly realize that the bank in which all your money was invested has gone bust. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, great. Mm -hmm. So, there's no easier or more effective way than investigating ourselves. Investigating ourselves is not opposed to um, faith in God, it's the way to gain real faith, real deep abiding faith in God. Yes, I think we do need this little bit of time. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. But we can't, we can't constantly rely on something outside ourselves, some kickstart coming from outside. We are, res we are responsible for the mess we're in. We also have to uh, get ourselves out of this mess. Because we've chosen to attach ourselves to all these things, to seek pleasure in all these things, we've got ourselves into this mess. So we've got to reverse the process. The help of God, divine grace, all these things, they're always there, they're never lacking. As Ramakrishna said, the grace of God and grace of Guru, they're always abundant and they're never lacking in the least. What's lacking is the grace of this ego. In other words, we don't yet have enough love for it. To get the, to get the love for it, we have to persevere in trying to investigate ourselves. 